All right, welcome to uh, our lesson, the story behind the senses. So our objectives and standards today to understand the concepts behind the senses and analyze the process of senses and take a look at the standards there, please. Desired result, how do the senses and the environment interact? And we have a few vocabulary here. Uh, sensation occurs when a stimulus activates a receptor. Perception, organization of sensory information into meaningful experiences. Psychophysics, the study of the relationship between sensory experiences and physical stimuli that cause them. An absolute threshold, weakest amount of stimulus that a person can detect half the time. Difference threshold, a fresh threshold, excuse me, uh, smallest change in a physical stimulus that can be detected half the time. Weber's law is a principle that for any change in a stimulus to be detected, a constant proportion of that stimulus needs to be added or subtracted. And signal detection theory study of people's tendencies to make correct judgments in detecting the present stimulus. I know a lot of those words are confusing. Don't stress out. We'll definitely try to make them more understandable. Um, I know some of them may seem very confusing right now, but hopefully they'll make sense to you at the end of the lesson. <clears throat> All right, so sensation. Our world is filled with many physical changes that include different sights, sounds, tastes, etc. Um, and changes in the environment uh, that cause an organism to respond are called stimuli. Now, examples of stimuli could be stubbing your toe. Um, you know, which would cause pain, obviously. You would react to that listening to a song on the radio, whether you like it or don't like it, and then tasting something sweet or sour. So these are all changes in our environment that cause our body to react in a certain way. Uh, these can also be measured in different ways, such as duration, how long a pain, like if you stub your toe, how long the pain lasts, um, intensity, size, or wavelength. And we typically use our five senses to um, react to things, so sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. Sensations can be combined with other sensations or past experiences to uh, create a perception. So the organization of sensory information into meaningful experiences is known as perception. Researchers and psychologists are interested in the relationship between stimuli and sensory experiences. And this is known as psychophysics, which is the study of how stimuli in the world uh, affect sensory experiences. Now, perception could be something like um, maybe you go to a theme park and you see a roller coaster and you get goosebumps on your skin. Maybe you start to feel a little nauseous in your stomach. Uh, maybe you, you start to sweat a little bit. You get kind of like that, that sweaty feeling um, on your skin. You know, maybe you start shaking a little bit you're, you know maybe you're, you feel like maybe your skin's kind of itchy and you're you know it kind of feels like something's crawling on your skin well this is a reaction or stimuli <clears throat> to your skin uh, from a past perception because maybe you rode a roller coaster in the past and you know it was a bad experience you didn't like it it really scared you so when you see a roller coaster now you begin to have those experiences all over again so this is th that's how we can tie perception and sensory information together Um, psychologists must determine how much of a stimulus is necessary for a person to sense it. Um, and experiments can be done to help test this. Uh, for example, they might put a person in a dark room and then gradually increase the light and ask the person when they finally are able to detect the light. Um, this is determine how much light is needed before the person says, hey, yeah, I see it. Um, and following the completion of many trials, the results are averaged. And this is what we know as the absolute threshold. This is the weakest amount of stimulus needed to produce a sensation. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, how much of a smell must be in a room for a person to smell it? What amount of pressure must be felt on the skin before a person feels it? Other examples as well. So here's some um, absolute threshold for the five senses. For vision, seeing a candle flame 30 miles away. Hearing, listening to a watch tick 20 feet away. Taste, tasting one teaspoon of sugar dissolved in two gallons of water. Smell, smelling one drop of perfume in a three room house. And touch, feeling a bee's wing falling about one centimeter on your cheek. Now you might say, 
that seems kind of small, you know, I, well, of course I can taste, you know, one teaspoon of sugar and water, you know, I'm, I'm going to notice that, um, you know, or smelling, you might say, of course I'm going to smell one drop of perfume, like, you're crazy, Mr. Sweeter, of course I'm going to smell that stuff, of course I'm going to taste that stuff. So while these may seem insignificant, compared to other animals, humans have a very limited range of the physical world. Uh, for example, dogs and dolphins, maybe you know this, can hear whistles we cannot. Maybe you've heard a dog whistle blown and dogs will go crazy. We can't hear it, but a dog can hear it and it really bothers them. So they have extremely sharp hearing. Uh, hawks have extremely sharp vision. They can see things, you know, miles and miles away on the ground. And even bloodhounds, uh, the dog, have a superior sense of smell. That's why they're used in tracking or finding things, because they have a super sense of smell. So again, these things seem, you know, kind of minuscule to us. So they go like, yeah, that's, you know, I can smell one drop of perfume. I know that. Um, but remember that other animals, you know, they might need half of that or, you know, or, or be able to see something farther away than we can. Difference threshold is another type of threshold for sensations. So it refers to the minimum amount of difference a person can detect between two stimuli. We'll get into this on the next slide. The just noticeable difference, or the JND, refers to the smallest increase or decrease in the intensity of a stimulus that a human is able to detect half the time. Um, so sensory experience depends more on changes in stimuli than about the absolute size or amount. So it's not about how much pressure, how, how hard, you know, you might stub your toe or how loud the song is. Um, it's more about um, the change in it, okay, if that makes sense. So noticing differences. This idea was first studied by Ernst Heinrich Weber, um, 1795 to 1878. <clears throat> That's the first picture there. And he and his student Gustav Theodor Fechner, um, 1801, 1801 to 1887, worked to study the human response for stimulus. And this is how we came up with Weber's law. It states that a larger, that the larger, excuse me, or stronger stimulus, the larger the change required for a person to notice is needed. Um, so for example, there are some sensations that require huge increases in sensation in order to be noticed. However, people can be more sensitive. You might be more sensitive to hot or cold than maybe your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad, you know. Um, so people can have different levels of sensitivity as well. Another example of this is, for example, electrical shock. If you get an electrical shock, um, you know, it, it hurts. Um, it needs to only be increased eight times to double the voltage for it to hurt again. So it only needs a little bit. But with light, we really, really, really need to increase the intensity of light for you to finally go, oh my gosh, my eyes, you know? Um, so, I mean, you know, if we, you know, if you, if you gradually dim a light or, you know, and then push the light back up, yeah, it might hurt your eyes a little bit, but your eyes will adjust pretty quickly. Um, we really need light to be like a bright flash of light in, in, in super intensity for you to notice it. <sighs> Research has shown that the senses are tuned to change. Um, they're most responsive to increases, decreases, and new events. Um, and changes in our environment allow us to adapt and respond because of our senses. So example, when we go to a movie theater and it's dark, uh, it takes a moment for our eyes to adjust uh, to the blackness before we can see faces or seats or the steps to walk up to go find a seat. Um, so that's an example of your sense, your senses, your eyes changing and adjusting. Your eyes are adapting to the change in the environment. It's also true for skin. Think about this. If you go swimming in a pool or a lake or the ocean, uh, when you get in that water, it's typically, I mean, sometimes it can be warm, uh, but typically, you know, it's, it's, it's a little cold or it's a different temperature. And you might go, oh, that's hot. You know, even if you get a, you know, you jump into a hot tub or something like that, you might say, oh, this water is really hot. It takes a while for your, for your skin to adjust to it, but your body will, you know, just like jumping into a, a cold pool you know, or lake, you know, at first you might go, oh my gosh, this is so cold. Well, that's your body reacting to that change. But again, your body then gradually adapts to where you go, oh, this ain't so bad. The pool water's nice, the lake's nice, you know, whatever. Okay, relationship between detection. In terms of stimuli we perceive and those we cannot perceive, there is no sharp boundary. Um, Relations between motivation, sensitivity, and decision-making in detecting a stimuli or not is known as signal detection theory. Okay, so noticing two different types of stimuli. We'll explain this a little bit. 
It involves recognizing a stimulus against the background of a competing stimuli. So think if you have two different stimuluses or two different events going on. Um, the single detection signal, excuse me, detection theory states that the stimulus or signal must be detected in the presence of a competing stimuli that can interfere with it. So for example, in relationship to the real world, radar operators, so men and women who, you know, watch airplanes, you know, there's little blips on the screen and make sure airplanes are flying okay. They have to be able to recognize a blip on an air, of an airplane compared to a flock of birds or bad weather on their screen. So they have to compare between the two things. They have to know, hey, that's an airplane, and hey, that's a, a storm cloud coming in. I need to let you know the pilot know there's a storm cloud coming in, there's bad weather coming in. Um, they need to be able to differentiate between those two stimuluses pretty quickly. A more maybe realistic version for you would be um, maybe struggling while you're working on a homework assignment or maybe on this lesson. Uh, maybe there's other noises, maybe there's a dog barking outside your house or maybe people are talking in your house or maybe the TV's on um, in the other room or something like that. Um, it's hard, you know, that's two different things. You're trying to focus on your assignments or, you know, this lesson and there's something going on outside that, you know, that you're, you're, you're still listening to. So you're competing between two different changes that are going on. You're trying to focus, but something else going on around you is making your mind kind of pull that way. Types of processing. Pre-attentive process and attentive process are the two types of ways stimuli or signals can be processed according to psychologists. In the pre-attentive process, information is extracted automatically and simultaneously. I'm going to give you a couple examples in a minute. The attentive process considers only, only a part of the stimuli at a time. So let's try this new activity for yourself. What I'd like you to do now is name the colors of the boxes as quick as you can. And I'll give you about 30 seconds to do this. Name the colors of the boxes as quick as you can. Okay, stop. <clears throat> Hopefully you were able to do that pretty quickly. Yellow, orange, green, blue. Wait, I, I did that wrong. <laughs> Yellow, red, green, orange, blue. Wait, hold on. Yellow, red. I'm, I'm messing this up for you guys. Yellow, red, green, orange. Red, yellow, yellow, red, green, orange, blue, orange, purple. I think I got it. I got it. Hopefully you got a laugh out of that. <laughs> you probably did it better than I could. Now, read the words, not the colors, as quick as possible. Read the words, not the colors. Okay, stop. So this is known as the Stroop effect, and it acts as an interference to our pre-attentive processing. You want to say, when you're looking at that word, I even have trouble doing this too. Everybody does sometimes. Um, but you want to look at that word and you want to say red, right, because you see the color. That's your automatic thing to do because we just went through color, so your mind's already preset on an attentive motion of color. So you're automatically looking at it and say, oh, red, blue, no, blue, red, you, you mess it up. So this is just kind of to show you that there can be competing stimuli that affect our senses. All right, story behind the senses. Senses allow reaction to changes in the environment, and there are different thresholds and detections for senses. All right. Um, and for your desired result, your closure here, remember to answer this question at the end, how do the senses and the environment interact? Um, and for the rest of this week, we'll be looking at the senses, vision, touch, taste, things like that. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. All right. Talk to you guys soon.